people, so researchers at Rockenstead, they work on different aspects of agricultural research, including soil science, as well as uh, crop science. So I belong to the crop community of the Institute. Uh, one more second. So as you know, the CRISPR-Cas technology, um, which is basically when we talk about genome editing, the genome editing technology these days, we're talking about CRISPR-Cas. So it, it's been around for, for some years. Um, and of course, you know that this technology has proven to be a very important tool for both uh, basic biology and um, different applications such as crop improvement. Um, and as you can see here in 20, what was that? In 2016, it was listed as one of the 10 breakthrough technologies. <clears throat> so by now, uh, it's been applied in, in many different uh, plant species. And this slide is just tells you that CRISPR-Cas has succeeded the older generations of the genome editing technology, such as zinc finger nucleases and tal effector nucleases. And unlike those older um, generations of the technology, CRISPR-Cas9 is a guide, in, is an RNA guided nuclease rather than um, a protein. So in this place, you've been successful with this technology, but some people might not know. Uh, how exactly it works. So when we apply it in plants, we go through a number of steps. And um, at the first step, we are uh, choosing our targets in a gene of interest. Then we assemble our DNA construct that gets delivered into plant using uh, transformation um, as a procedure. And then finally, we get our transgenic lines and we screen for modifications of interest. Uh, genomic modifications. So by now, this technology has been successfully applied in various crops. And as you can see here, for example, the oil stability was improved in, uh, in soybean and oil seed rape by knocking out the FAT2, uh, fatty acid desaturase 2. In tomato, the plant architecture could be dramatically improved by mutagenizing three genes at the same time. So basically in this case, a highly compact and rapid flowering tomato was produced, uh, which is highly suitable for urban agriculture. In wheat, uh, gluten levels were reduced by targeting genes encoding alpha gliadins. And Again, in wheat, uh, disease resistance was improved to powdery mildew by knocking out the MLO locus. So uh, I come from the Sainsbury lab and the Sainsbury lab is focused on uh, mechanisms of disease resistance in plants. And when it comes to disease resistance, I mean, there are two ways we can improve it. We can um, target, a so-called susceptibility gene and uh, a susceptible cultivar then carries an S gene that confers susceptibility to a pathogen. But by removing it, and we can do, in, we can do it using the reverse genetics, we can then create uh, a resistant cultivar. And in this case, we're talking about recessive resistance. An alternative strategy and perhaps a more common one is to add a resistance gene to a susceptible cultivar. And again, this can be achieved by, by crossing. So we can introgress this resistance uh, locus into um, a cultivar which is susceptible, or we can use transgenesis and um, just express it using the transgenesis technique. In this case, we are talking about dominant resistance. So I will just uh, talk about the first strategy. And here is the, the paper that we published some time ago. 
in 2017. And this is where we successfully targeted the MLO locus in tomato. So as I already mentioned, um, I mean, MLO has been around for a long time and it's a classic susceptibility locus. It's very conserved and it's present in monocots as well as dicots. So in this case, we targeted this gene, um, tomato MLO1 gene with two guide RNAs and generated a number of transgenic lines. And as you can see here, when we amplified across the targeted region, we got all these multiple band shifts um, suggesting uh, edits because basically when a DNA fragment drops out, I mean, in between the target sites, then we get a PCR, PCR amplifiers which are shorter than in the wild type. And we confirm these mutations by sequencing. So as you can see here, uh, Cas9 uh, cut DNA in the majority of cases, three nucleotides away from the palm motif, and this is the predicted cut position. So then uh, we were interested in phenotyping these uh, edited lines and we uh, subjected uh, our edit, edited lines to the pathogen called Oidium neolecopexity. And as you can see here, the wild type was fully susceptible, but the edited line uh, was resistant. So when it comes to genome editing, uh, it's important to make sure that <clears throat> the line that you generate, I mean, at least when it comes to crop improvement applications, it's important to make sure that the final uh, genome edited line doesn't carry any transgenic DNA. And um, we decided to segregate the tDNA out. So as you can see here, this gel shows you, the top, uh, the top panel shows you the band shift. So uh, the wild type band is running higher and the mutant band is running lower because of the deletion. But the bottom panel, it shows you that the tDNA was successfully segregated uh, out of the five um, uh, T1 lines. And these are lines 8.1 to 8.5, while the line 8-6 retained the tDNA. We also confirmed the, uh, the absence of the tDNA using the next generation sequencing. So as you can see here, two edited lines, 8-2 and 8-4, were checked for the presence of tDNA reads, and they were free from tDNA reads while the 8-6 the line actually um, carried reads um, covering, basically corresponding to the tDNA. So the whole pipeline of generating um, a tDNA-free variety uh, cultivar or line, uh, it took us less than 10 months. So um, it's a fairly um, rapid process, but of course it's all crop dependent and it depends on uh, the actual transformation procedure. But we know about speed breeding these days, so things can be uh, sp sped up if necessary. So, the CRISPR, well, the genome editing technology is evolving all the time, and uh, the literature, I mean, basically, uh, uh, publications, um, basically papers on the technology, uh, new, 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 new reports, they appear on a weekly basis. So new, uh, more and more new tools become available, and it's important to be able to keep track of these tools and to be able to absorb these tools into your uh, research pipeline. So in order to do this, we decided to create a cloning toolkit that can, uh, that can be used, which is highly flexible and allows one to add new tools um, easily. So uh, this toolkit is based on the Golden Gate cloning method, and it's a modular cloning method. So, as you can see here, we have our classic Cas9, which um, that comes from Staphylococcus pyogen, but there are other Cas9 variants. And also there are alternative CRISPR nucleases, such as CPF1, which is now called Cas12A. There are also base editors um, 
that allow you to convert uh, DNA bases. Um, so they don't really cut your, your DNA locus, but they, they cause um, base conversions, let's say from C to T or G to A. And a rather new tool is prime editors. So these ones can be used for, uh, for introducing precise uh, genomic modifications such as nucleotide substitutions, small insertions or deletions. Anyway, in order to absorb all these tools, we, uh, as I said, we decided to, to generate this cloning toolkit and this was published in 2020. Uh, and the way the Golden Gate system works, we have a library of genetic elements and these genetic elements, they are level zero elements such as promoters, open reading frames and terminators. And then these genetic, genetic elements can be combined into uh, gene expression units. And these are called level one units. And then level one units can be combined <clears throat> together into and assembled into level two multi-gene constructs. So using this toolkit, which is compatible with toolkits uh, that use the same uh, Golden Gate system. And it's a good thing because uh, we can basically share our modules with other labs that have ad adopted the same system and we can exchange materials and basically uh, these materials can be deposited into a, a, depositories, a repository such as Adgen and then shared with the research community. So um, basically the toolkit includes various promoters, CRISPR nucleases, terminators, as well as um, polymerase 3 promoters for expressing guide RNAs and things like selectable markers. So all of these can be then relatively easily assembled into um, level two constructs and these constructs are ready to be deployed into your crop species of interest. Well, one of the highlights of the kit is, um, is the, the ability to assemble um, tRNA, sgRNA, polycystronic constructs. And in this case, we have two different guide RNA backbones. One of them is the classic backbone is the, and the second one is the improved backbone. So um, the system is based <clears throat> on the system published some time ago in RISE, but in that case, the constructs were assembled using overlapping PCR and it was a rather cumbersome way of assembling them. So uh, in our case, the whole thing can be assembled by passing the PCR step and it's fairly easy. So the polycystronic transcript uh, would then get spliced by the by the spli uh, by the RNA nucleases which are present in the plant, and uh, the guide RNAs are then released by these RNA nucleases, and these guide RNAs can then target your uh, intended genomic targets. So this system allows you to target multiple genes or multiple uh, targets within one particular gene in your plant uh, genome of interest. So the way um, the assembly process works, we, we use a double-stranded polygon, and then this gets integrated into a level zero uh, vector. So, and finally, when we, uh, after introducing uh, these 20 base pair guide uh, into the level zero plasmid, we then assemble our level one plasmid that carries a polymerase three promoter and up to six guides. And then the whole thing can get inserted into the level two construct that carries, let's say, Cas9 in addition to the selectable marker. So I am part of the design and future WIT program and obviously, we are interested in working uh, on wheat and this program, um, basically applying the technology in wheat. And this program in, uh, in includes quite a number of research institutes and universities in the UK. And Rothamstadt is one of them. 
So when it comes to genomarity and wheat, uh, obviously um, this tool is highly useful. It's very useful for polyploid like wheat because it carries three different genomes. Uh, and basically in the majority of cases, is each gene is represented by six copies. So targeting, doing uh, reverse genetics in wheat using, let's say, tilling lines, using the tilling technology is quite problematic because you need to do multiple crosses to get rid of background mutations. And then you need to combine the tilling mutations um, in genomes A, B, and D, and the whole process is quite slow. But CRISPR-Cas, obviously, uh, using CRISPR-Cas, you can target all copies at the same time. So we tested our toolkit first in, in protoplast. So we targeted three different genes, and they are homo um, no, they are not homologous. Each of these genes was represented by three homologs, um, but they are fairly conserved homologs. So we assembled our constructs and um, this construct carried guides represented by red arrows showing on this um, slide. And then we transformed wheat protoplasts and we tested three different Cas9 variants, which that were PFH 23, 66, and 67. And these red asterisks, they indicate uh, the bands that so these bands, the band shifts uh, indicated by the red asterisk, they are produced due to CRISPR-Cas activity. So as I already showed you in the case of tomato, um, CRISPR-Cas cuts the genomic DNA and then the fragment, um, the amplicon becomes shorter because of the introduced deletion. But as you can see here, one of the Cas9 variants is working much better than the other two. And this is now our default choice when it comes to Cas9 uh, applications in wheat. So finally, we wanted to test the system in transgenic lines. And uh, when it comes to transgenic transgenesis in wheat, so, so far at Rothamsted, we've been using the particle bombardment as a transformation method. Um, so you, as you know, DNA, uh, DNA gets loaded on gold particles and then the, the gold particles are then they are shot into, into immature embryos, then we generate colors and regenerate plants. So, um, but we are in process of setting up the agrobacterium mediated transformation method right now, because we think that the agro-mediated transformation is more advantageous for genome editing because we can, uh, it's easier to segregate out a transgene and generate a, a line which is transgene free. Nevertheless, the, um, the lines that I'm gonna talk about, they've been generated using the bombardment technique. So in this case, we targeted the STP6 gene, which is an R gene, um, <coughs> Conferring resistance to Zymoseptoria triticae, and uh, we did it as a follow as a follow up to a, a story that was published in Nature Genetics, and you can see this um, this paper here. So this gene was targeted by five different guides, and then I mean we used exactly the same genotyping strategy as in tomato, so it was based on band shifts, and finally um, confirmed presence of indoles using um, Sanger sequencing. So these genome edited lines, they were then phenotyped using the respective um, Zymoseptoria triticae isolate. And as you can see here, Cadenza, which is the wild app um, line of wheat um, is is resistant to, to this isolate because it carries the wild app STP6 gene, but the edited lines, they were susceptible, indicating that the gene was disrupted. So I also have a collaboration with Matthew Paul at Rothamsted, and he's working on the 
sugar metabolism. So trihalose 6-phosphate pathway, which is a very important pathway involved in carbon partitioning in wheat and other cereals. Well, in fact, not only cereals, and also in, 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 in dicots. So as part of this project, we targeted the trihalose phosphate synthase genes. And this is the enzyme which is encircled here in red. Um, and uh, the TPS7 gene is present in nine copies. So basically it's present on chromosome one, five, and seven. And I must say, we successfully generated uh, edited lines, although there were problems with genotyping, not always is possible to, to amplify and uh, sometimes PCR gets biased. And in some cases, we were unable to detect reads corresponding to certain subgenomes. Nevertheless, so we got our, um, our T2, population and in the T2 population we got segregation of, of phenotypes so clearly TPS7 gene is involved in spike morphology and uh, seed size so as you can see here we, we got very wide spikes with bigger grains and also we got ears where the grains are bigger but the number is less and also strange looking spikes as you can see in the middle panel so we are still in process of um, genotyping uh, this, uh, this population and basically trying to link phenotype to genotype. So CRISPR-Cas applications in crops. I mean, basically, uh, as I already explained, um, CRISPR-Cas or genome editing is an excellent tool for reverse genetics. So you can use it to knock out your favorite gene and then observe the phenotype. But you can also uh, speed up the breeding cycle by um, introducing a mutation or add it into your elite cultivar. And basically in this case, um, if the added can force that advantageous phenotype, you don't need to uh, go through a lengthy procedure of introducing that allele from, let's say, a land race or cultivar that has some undesired characteristics, because then the whole process will take a long time because you need to do multiple uh, back crossings. But of course, there are limitations to uh, applying this technology because uh, there are not so many examples where you can confer this advantageous phenotype by uh, knocking out a gene. So when it comes to more sophisticated applications such as allele replacements, this technology in wheat is still in process of development because the whole uh, homologous recombination procedure process is fairly inefficient in plants. So for people who are not familiar so much with uh, transgenesis or genome editing, I just want to highlight the differences between uh, GM crops and genome edited crops. So when we are talking about genome editing, of course we need to deliver our transgene and this transgene encodes CRISPR-Cas reagents. So in, it encodes uh, genes that would then get expressed and deliver those CRISPR-Cas reagents into plant cell. But finally, we end up with our desired edit and we can then segregate the transgene out and the final product carries the edit, but no transgenic DNA. But in the case of a GMO product, the transgene is actually part of the product. And in this case, of course, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a plant that carries this transgenic element. So, which is basically transgene is part of it. So the situation when it comes to the um, uh, policy aspect of this technology, the situation in the world is improving. So, well, this slide is already a little bit out of date. It was from a paper, it's from a paper that, that was published two years ago. But nevertheless, as you can see here, quite a few countries in the world, they are opening up to this technology and uh, now including India and China. Uh, and of course, um, in the UK, we also have um, 
a, a bill which is currently going through the parliament and it's called genetic technology precision breeding bill so uh, under this bill genome crops that carry um, which are basically genome edited crops that they do not carry any transgenic dna they will be exempt uh, from being treated as genetically modified organisms so we expect this bill to to be uh, basically to become to become a law this year and uh, there is a lot of excitement uh, in the research community about it so and finally this is my acknowledgement slide i want to uh, thank members of my team and sirisha kaniganti mark wilkinson i i have i only have two people at the moment uh, in my team as well as former members of the of the of the lab and collaborators including the ones at the Junina center who are helping us with setting up the agrobacterium mediated transformation <laughs> with transformation method so yes thank you very much for your attention and i'm happy to take any questions So anyone wants to, to make a question? Yes. Hi, Vladimir. Very nice presentation. Uh, thank you so much for coming here and uh, making this presentation. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, you said you used three different Cas9 vari variants. Mm -hmm. So can you please expand a little bit more? Uh, what is the basis? What are the different um, activities? Well, uh, these are Cas9 variants that came from different labs. So uh, I need to look up the details, but um, so one of them I think came from Kai Shigao's lab. Then the second one from um, Akunov lab, you know, uh, you know that lab, right? Um, and the third one and the most successful, it was actually developed at Rothamsted. So that one, as far as I can tell, um, the the difference could be in the nuclear localization signal because the Rothamsted construct carries the nuclear localization signal that that comes from a histone 2b it's not like a classic um uh, uh nuclear localization signal like sv40 for example so um it's basically part of the histone 2b and it could be that it just gets imported into the nucleus more efficiently um, as compared to other uh, constructs. So uh, I have two more questions if nobody else is asking. Can I go, to, go for two more questions? So this is regarding the polycystronic construct. Uh, mm -hmm. I have used that uh, Kevin Jai et al. paper for rice that, that works really good. So if you have used that in your lab, how many different guides can you include? How many practically you have included uh, in your construct? So the kind of the basic setup is you can include six guides, but okay. that's in your level one, but you can have two or three level one. So in theory, you can go up to 24, but the thing is that you there is no point in having too many guides because um, Cas9 pool is limited. So if you if this pool gets split across many guides, then what happens is that your guide RNA Cas9 complex concentration goes down and then it becomes less efficient uh, against those um, specific targets. So if you have too many guides, you might your, your CRISPR activity might drop because you have too many too many sites to target and Cas9 pool is limited, uh, as I already mentioned. Um, but I would say I wouldn't express more than, I mean, these days, if we target a gene, we normally use four guides because, well, I mean, we are trying to predict whether this particular guide is going to be active uh, <laughs> or not so active based on the secondary uh, RNA structure. So there is a website that can help you to, to determine the secondary structure of your guide RNA. And um, it actually came from from a paper by Holger Puchter. He is using 
uh, this method to predict the activity. Uh, I can I can send you the link if you want. Uh, but and of course there are many online tools that can tell you. They can produce a score reflecting the activity, but normally these algorithms are based on animal studies and people in the plant field they were finding little correlation between that predicted activity score and the actual activity observed in in plant so but our but generally we are not going for guides that carry uh, like a repetitive sequence like aaa ddd and, and of course these they serve as a polymerase 3 um, termination transcription termination signal so you don't want like poly, a poly t element let's say in your guide well slightly technical but yeah, do you have more questions? <laughs> yeah, the last one. So uh, did you use the prime editor and base editor? The, uh, you, base you editors. About two, two about prime editor? um, no. Uh, well, I must say the base editors kind of evolved from the point we published this paper. So there was this, there were two papers published by a Chinese group where they claim like high well, basically, where they published these base editors, and it looks like they are significantly more efficient than the previous versions. So we have synthesized them, and we have them. So, I mean, we are happy to share uh, if you if you would like um, on an MTA. Uh, <laughs> um, but I was trying to contact the, that Chinese group and confirm because you see in the in the in the materials and methods. They kind of tell you which blocks they used and they tell you how these blocks were assembled to create those constructs. But finally, when I asked them to confirm whether my sequence is correct, I, I never heard anything back. So, I mean, I, I did my best guess based on what they tell me and how the primers were designed and everything. But um, yeah, I mean, I didn't have a very good experience with uh, contacting those people. Um, Okay, so. Uh, Vladimir, there is a question uh, from uh, online participant, Dr. Bhuja. He's asking, is there any gene edited beet variety or products that you are aware of that are available to date? A genome edited wheat variety on the market. Um, yeah, maybe if it is in the market or maybe a trait that you are aware of, which is an advanced stage of development. Well, at Rothamsted, actually, uh, we have this uh, low acrylamide wheat. So basically, asparagin synthase 2 was targeted by CRISPR-Cas. I was not involved in that, uh, in that project, but uh, Rothamsted has conducted a field trial. And um, as far as I understand, they will try to commercialize it, obviously subject to a CRISPR license and they need it. <laughs> so this is another big problem for uh, commercializing this kind of uh, crops. So yeah, so low acrylamide wheat from Rottenstedt is, I'm aware of that, but um, well, when it comes to wheat, I mean, I know there is a transgenic wheat variety produced in Argentina and this, this is on the market, but genome edited, I'm not aware about something yeah. any other questions from the audience here regarding the evolution architecture targeted 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 in the case of which gene target to change the morphology of that spine so yeah so when we design our guides we always check for off targets and we we basically choose guides that have the minimum um with the fewest predicted of targets. I mean, we, you know, the wheat genome is very large. So sometimes we cannot uh, choose guides which are completely off target free, but there is a website 
And I think finally they managed to upload the weed genome into it. And that website called CC Top, they they will tell you which of targets are in the intergenic regions and which of targets are within exonic uh, regions. So if they are in intergenic regions, it's less of a worry because obviously they are not actually compromising genes, although some non-coding genetic elements can be important as well. Um, but... Vladimir, I believe the question that is asking is about the T6P uh, work that you yes. showed. And so you had these spikes uh, and ah. the difference in morphology. So, uh... He's, so, so the question is whether that phenotype was caused by a targeting. Or was it an intended effect? No, I believe it's an it's intended effect because uh, actually we expect phenotype related to grain uh, spike development and grain size. So I don't believe um, this is due to off-targeting. And um, and as I said, when we were designing those constructs, we chose guides with no off-targets predicted or with minimum uh, off-target effects, but. We can always go back to, to those predicted of targets. You can just amplify across those of targets and then check if actually, uh, if some mutations have been introduced. Thank you. Vladimir? Right. Thanks for the presentation. Just a general question. This is very not very specific. Uh, you said that you were transforming by using bombardment. Is there any update in new methodologies to actually do it? I feel like it's been like 20 years, people using agrobacterium or realistics. Is there something new that is coming up in the area of transformation? Um, well, we have now <clears throat> developmental regulators as a, as a, as a tool to, Im to improve transformation efficiency. So basically these are um, uh, genes involved in somatic embryogenesis and if you co if you co-deliver them together with your transgene of interest they can actually boost uh, the transformation efficiency because they boost formation of somatic embryos and and finally uh, you get many more transformers so um, i mean there are different versions there are different uh, <laughs> um, technologies around to choose from, um, and some of them they are commercial technologies. So some one of them comes from Corteva, for example. There is another one, Wax Five. It comes from uh, Japan Tobacco, another company. But the one that we are uh, trying to um, that that we are working with right now, it comes from UC Davis. So we are not restricted in using this uh, technology. It's called, it's a GRF, GIF, basically two transcription factors fused together and uh, it really boosts uh, the transformation efficiency in wheat. Um, so that paper was published in 2021, I think in Nature Biotechnology and Jorge, George Dubkovsky, he's the one who published that. But in terms of like new transformation methods, of course, people are working on things like nanoparticle delivery. Uh, I mean, it's still early days, but it looks like there might be some <laughs> interesting, um, uh, you know, they might, finally they might succeed with it, but it would be great. I mean, if you could just, I mean, apparently you could just water your plant with this <laughs> suspension of nanoparticles and everything gets they get systemically delivered through the vascular tissue and uh, then end up in the in the meristem and then do the edits and you collect seeds and, and they are already mutated so that would be awesome so i think um this is where i mean it might happen in the future and i mean there is a lab in in us um in berkeley actually they are working on it. Yeah, I'm aware of them. Yeah, th <laughs> thank you for your question. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. I'm Dr. Madhu from India. Uh, sir, I want to know about the BLAST 
that we talk about the disease, that is the weight blast we talk. Uh, in case of rice, uh, there has been um, success uh, for developing, uh, for using the CRISPR Cas for developing rice blast. But what is the scenario about wheat blast and has the uh, program initiated uh, for its control using CRISPR Cas technology? Um, yes. Yeah, so, actually, my previous lab, Sofian Kamon, he he had a project on wheat blast, and it was about using CRISPR, the CRISPR technology to improve resistance to blast. Um, so that this was based on basically they were trying to target hom hom homologs of susceptibility genes present in rice. So they, they took those as, gene, as genes um, from rice and then they found wheat homologs and they tried to target them in wheat. Um, but there was no success as far as I understand. I mean, it's not surprising because wheat and rice, they're actually very different. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but there were also challenges, you know, with properly genotyping those plants. And um, um, I am, I need, I, I need to ask for for the latest. Um, I need to ask them for an update on the whole situation. But I think so far uh, they haven't been successful with improving resistance to weed blast using this kind of method. Yeah. Any more questions from the audience at the auditorium or online? Okay, we, we, yeah. So we don't see any more questions, then let's thank Dr. Vladimir for an excellent presentation and taking us through the work that uh, he and his team have been doing in Rothamsted. We look forward to a successful collaboration with you, Vladimir, and please feel free to reach out to Vladimir in case there are any questions or you would like to um, collaborate with the team. Thank you. Mm -hmm.